Since I spoke to more, look at your fucking you got a Cyberdyne t-shirt, you got Iron Man behind you. Are you a nerd by any chance? Uh, sir, it takes one to know one. <laughs> <laughs> Most people don't know what Cyberdyne is. Only yeah, you know. I guess. Yeah, right. I guess. I yeah, hoist exactly. on my own petard there, yeah. Right, exactly. Although uh, some people in hospitality were like, are you wearing a Terminator t-shirt? I'm like, oh, at least you know the move. Anyway, so <laughs> I spoke to you earlier this year, and I've spoken to you a number of times over the years, and I tried to come up with a whole bunch of new questions today. Let's see how this effing goes. Okay. <laughs> what What is the difference between making something in America versus the United Kingdom? Well, it's a, it's a shorter commute uh, if I make it in the United Kingdom, obviously, because I live there. Um I don't know. I, I think the it's interesting with with something like this luck because I'm I'm sort of doing both. I'm 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 based in the UK, and this was because of the pandemic as much as anything else. I'm in a little studio that's that's been set up at my home, but I'm talking to Los Angeles and Peggy Holmes, who's directing me from there. So I'm kind of it's a bit of a hands across the ocean moment there. And in that regard, making an animation in the US or the UK is is exactly the same. There's there's very little difference whatsoever. Um, and similarly, in, in live action terms, you know, the process doesn't, you know, what changes is the terms. Like in, in America, they say last looks. In the UK, they say final checks just before you shoot and makeup and hair come in and what have you. Um, and there's a couple, craft services is better in the US, that's for sure. Wait, I was literally <laughs> going to say, I've been on sets in both and the number one difference is craft service. Yeah. In the, in the UK, about 4 p.m., you get some moldy sandwiches, and that's it. <laughs> I, you know, the, the, the funny thing is you're not exaggerating. It's really, it's, it's really that dramatic. Um, you know. you, you've gotten to do a lot of cool things because of who you are. Rank how high on the list was going backstage with your daughter to meet BTS. That was up there. That was seriously up there. I mean, I mean, I'd become a sort of BTS fan via um, via her. She'd sort of introduced me to them, and um, I had become like. I mean, watch a lot of them on YouTube. So by the time we went to see them in Las Vegas, I kind of was like genuinely a fan, and so meeting them was just surreal because we walked into a room and they were just stood there, just waiting for us to walk in, and they were absolutely lovely. And um, it was extraordinary. And I, I was a little starstruck. Were they sort of like, do they do this with a lot of people? Do they have any idea? Have they seen Shaun of the Dead? Do you know what I mean? Well, RM, who is the, the probably the most um, adept English speaker of the group, although they're all sort of like, you know, getting better at speaking English. Um, he's a bit of a movie fan. And, and he'd gone to see Baby Driver with V, another one of the band. Um, so he was aware of, of my work for sure. And we had a little chat about movies and stuff. I, I didn't know if, if the other guys had seen Shaun of the Dead or anything like that. I mean, I presume they have. Um, <laughs> but, um, but they were just really lovely. It was a nice moment. If you could get the financing to make anything you want, uh, what would you make and why? Is there something that's been like kicking around in your brain? Oh my God, yeah, loads of things. I mean, and it probably wouldn't be something vast and big it would just be the chance to make I, I have a couple of things that i'm developing um right now which i so i won't sort of talk about them specifically but um getting them made would be really fun without the sort of the, the haggle and wrangle of trying to get people to sort of like have faith in an original idea these days you know that's kind of difficult um if you just had unlimited resources you could you know you could make the kind of stuff the kind of stuff I miss seeing at the cinema, really. Uh, I put on Twitter that I was going to talk to you. I had a few people ask questions, but I'm going to ask the one from someone named Nick. And he asked me to ask, is there ever going to be a third season of Space? <laughs> that would be Nick Frost. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you, think I, you think I'm joking? He really put this on there. <laughs> oh, I know. I know. Because he knows that question rankles me. Uh, tell him that we made it. We just didn't cast him in it. <laughs> Um, you know I love the show, and and I'm I'm actually going to be serious about this. Is I think that what like when you look at Top Gun Maverick, and the the use of time between the original and now, it made the movie. And so many people are making things where they're using the real time to continue telling a story. Is there actually any real interest in your brain? Like, 
would I want to revisit these characters, you know, 30 years later and see what they're doing? Or is it really like you're so tired of this question? I think the great thing about Top Gun Maverick was that they made it about, you know, it, it, it wasn't just about continuing the story. There was a there was a relevance to what has happened in the world since. And also a kind of strange parallel between Maverick and Tom being these kind of emissaries from an almost forgotten era of something, you know? Like Maverick is the last sort of fighter pilot and Tom is the last movie star. And there was a real sort of, there was just a really beautiful timing of all that kind of stuff. I'm not sure what would be the value of seeing Tim and Daisy beyond that moment in their lives because Spaced was all about that moment specifically. It wasn't about those characters as much as it was about what it was like to be in your 20s at the turn of the century, at the very beginning of the kind of the age of the geek, you know, when, when we were just realizing that we could actually spend some of our adulthood uh, participating in the things that we enjoyed as kids. You know, that was the, the, the beginnings of that era, which is now the norm. So um, I'm not sure. I don't, I don't think if I want to see them again, really. Sure. Uh... It is interesting because you and I are old enough to know when you look back at that era, it was just such a different world for geeks and nerds. It, it was just, not, you know what I mean? It was it's like a 180. Um, yeah, absolutely, yeah. Um, if you, you've made a lot of projects, is there one on your resume that you think like deserves more people checking out because you're really proud of it and maybe it just didn't get seen by enough people? Yeah, a couple of them actually. I, I did a film called Hector and the Search for Happiness, which is a sort of um, kind of fabulistic travelogue about a, I mean, really, it was about a, a kind of middle-aged white guy who isn't happy. So I can understand why people were like, eh, what's his problem? But um, it was a really amazing film to make. It was a lot of fun. It's a very beautiful film. The message of it is lovely. Um, so, and, I, and what's nice is that anyone who does see it tends to sort of like be very effusive about about what it means to them, which is nice. Uh, I did a, a anything, when you do s small movies, you kind of want them to be seen by the, the, the same people, that, the same amount of people that watch the big movies. And so I've done little indie films, a film like, like Lost Transmissions or something that you, you, you hoped would have reached a, a larger audience. But the fact is, you know, the more sort of specific and uh, serious you get, often, you know, the appeal becomes more focused and, and those films will never exist on the scale of, you know, the kind of pure entertainment movies. Uh, when was the last time you rewatched something the way you did it back when you were a teenager in your 20s, the way you would revisit Empire Strikes Back again and again? Have you done that with a TV show or a movie since your 20s? Weirdly enough, I watched on the flight over to New York, I watched Blade Runner 2049 again. Um, because I really, really like that film. I, I feel like it's a little too long, um, but I don't blame Denny Villeneuve for loving the world so much he wanted to sort of stay in, stay in it for a little longer than two hours. But I think as a sequel, it's, um, it's a really brilliant evolution of the first film, you know, the idea, taking the idea of the first film and evolving those ideas. And I, 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 I like rewatching that film. I've watched a lot of films recently, again, because my I have a teenage daughter, and we spend a lot of our times watching a lot of our time watching movies together. She's a big horror buff, so I've gone back and um, shown her horror movies that I loved as a kid, and it's been really educational doing that. Like watching a film like Reanimator, which I remember as being uproariously funny and kind of you know super kind of cool when I was 16 and then watching it with a teenage girl who's like, dad, why is she naked? Why, why is there this scene when this woman is being abused by a severed head? How is that entertaining? And, and I'm, I'm going, oh yeah. <laughs> we have come on a little bit since then. And, um, but at the same time, you know, she loves, her favorite film is, is The Shining. You know, she really, really digs that. So that's really fun to, to see that again through the eyes of a, of a child. Or oh, the best thing was, Terminator, what, showing her, she knew nothing about Terminator, showing her the first one, and then showing her the second one with her not knowing the twist, which we all did going into it and we saw it. And her saying to me in the early stages, he's a bit different in this, Dad. He's kind of, he's not as mean. And like, like she fucking called it, you know? That was kind of insane. Jumping into why I actually get to talk to you, what are you most excited about for audiences to see and look? 
I think luck, I mean, it's just an incredibly realized world that they've built, you know, in terms of the, the luck dimension where, where good luck and bad luck get made. It, it, it's such a triumph of animation. It's so beautifully intricate and the way that it moves and the way good luck and bad luck are different. Um, all that as, as spectacle is wonderful, but I think at the heart of it is this really lovely message about, you know, how we create our own luck and how good things happen to you when you start behaving like a good person. I think, I think it's full of, as the best animations are, <laughs> full of messages which appeal to both, you know, young and old people alike. And um, it was a really fun uh, record to do, you know. I think it's a, it's a really beautiful movie and a great sort of kickoff for Skydance Animation. What was it like actually developing another Scottish accent that was not Scotty? <laughs> well, I have one Scottish accent, so really, I just did that one. I, I kind of, I kind of got because, because, because my wife is Glaswegian. My Scottish accent generally hovers around the sort of west coast of Scotland, the sort of southwest, midwest coast, I guess, of Scotland. And I didn't really want to sort of deviate. Now that I'm good at it, I didn't want to deviate into other areas of Scotland because I mean, it gets quite different in the east and up the north. Um, so really, it's a similar, similar voice, but. The interesting thing about Bob is that he's not entirely what he seems. And um, that was a fun part of him to play, that he's also carrying quite a dark secret with him. Animated projects often go through like a lot of radical changes. Um, and so how did luck change as you were recording? Or was it pretty much like the whole, like what it, the final product was ultimately what you started with? Well, the great thing about animation is that you can sort of forensically construct it um, as you go and you know you do a bit of voice and then they as soon as the animators get the voice they are able to sort of start constructing the film the director peggy holmes in this case was able to as as every animation director gets to do is is pick each line reading and compile the entire vocal uh, track of the um of the of the film really carefully as you do that things come up and you think oh hang on that idea would work better if we did this here and you are able to make those changes as you go so though the film was pretty much you know what it was when we started um, there were lots of little details which were able to be adjusted and finessed and nuanced as we as we went along which was uh, it's exciting how long did you know that the mission impossible titles were going to be dead reckoning do you know what i found out on the day of the trailer and not from chris mcquarrie i found out from the trailer so, so I immediately, you know? no, no one told me. So I, I texted, I texted McHugh and was like, dead reckoning? Were you going to tell us that at some point? Um, I, I heard it was going to be something else. But, um, but I, I like that. I like that. Because it reminds me of what, Land of the Dead was originally called Dead Reckoning. So finally I get to be in a film called Dead Reckoning. When you heard the title, did it make sense to you with what the story is? But you know what I mean? Oh, 100%. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I know you're not going to uh, say too much, but where are you in the filming of MI8 right now? We've just started. So we're, we're right back to the beginning again. There's still a couple of things to pick up with seven because I think the way eight evolves might sort of like determine a few things, which is a great sort of luxury we have in this situation, being able to do two films back to back. Um, but yeah, we are, we are now in officially in production of, of uh, Dead Reckoning Part 2. Cannot effing wait. Listen, man, always great to talk with you. Uh, wish you nothing but the best. You know, have Thanks, a great buddy. day, man. Thanks. Nice to see you.